Thank you so much for the introduction, Nari. Thank you, Dilwar, for your opening words, which I think resonate with us all. Thank you, Rabia, for a very warm invitation. As I was saying to Naveed, one of the reasons I said yes was actually the very warm invitation I received um, to come and speak here. And when you receive a warm invitation, it says something about the person, it says something about the organization. And I suppose invitations matter to me, not because I've written a book on hospitality, but because um, the last Islam conference I actually spoke at was about 15 years ago. Uh, it was a Muslim Council of Britain conference. It didn't go down too well with the Muslim Council, and I was never invited back. Um, and actually, that was a turning point for me, thinking the reason it didn't go down well with many of the audiences there was because I didn't fit the picture of what a Muslim should be speaking about or look like and say. And then I thought, what do I do? Do I carry on engaging? Um, and I realized, actually, for us academics, especially post-Brexit, post-Trump, post-everything at the moment, we have a moral duty to keep on enge being engaged in the big questions, as you were saying. There is no way to hide. What affects us on the streets affects us in the academy. What we say in the academy has an impact on what happens in society. And so when I joined Edinburgh, and I'm just telling you this so you get a sense of where I am at the moment, um, part of the role that I had was assistant principal for religion and society, which was to reflect and encourage me to continue public engagement. Because actually, even after I'd done my PhD, the most important thing for me was, how does law, and Naveed said that my PhD was in Islamic law and my research interest is primarily in that, how does law relate to ethics? And by ethics, I mean, how do we know what we're doing is right? How do, we, how do we make decisions about the right way to live? And Islam and Judaism are often categorized as religions that are focused on obedience more than belief. Uh, that our belief system is really about, if I do this, am I worshiping God in the right way? So ethics has a personal and academic and a societal value for me, because actually everything that we do is really about ethics, the choices we make. I've just got a few reflections on ethics, and then I'll go on to talk about what I think I was asked to address with the recent Sharia review that I did for the Home Office, and why ethics matters in that as well, on a really practical level. When I, when I finished my PhD, I remember saying to my supervisor, I want to look at the area of ethics because ethics has been unexplored in Islamic thought. And he said, well, what is ethics? And I started thinking about how does one define ethics in Islamic thought as opposed to ethics in Christian ethics? And years ago, I'd, I'd asked a Christian ethicist at Yale Divinity School to tell me what is specifically Christian about Christian ethics. And he said, Christian ethics is Christ-centered. So I asked him, well, explain what that means, which he didn't, but, I, it, but it stayed with me. There's, there's a focus there, the Christocentric um, emphasis in Christian ethics. And I started thinking, do we have anything similar in Islam? If I said, if I ask people, where do you get your ethical, people will say, I look at the Quran, I look at Hadith, I look at law books, but how do we do ethics? Do we just take verses out here and there? How do we process them? How do we live them as a live reality in our, in our religious life? And then Michael Cook's book came out, which was Commanding Right and Forbidding Wrong, both a thin one and a huge volume. And I think that in the monotheistic faith, to some extent, God and morality are connected through the simple divine command and covenant of let there rise up from you a nation inviting to all that is good enjoining what is right and forbid, forbidding what is wrong. And it sounds really simple. Who wouldn't want to enjoy what is right and forbid what is sinful? And actually that is so difficult because ethics is really how do we know what is right and how do we know what is wrong? It's also been asked whether this is the essence of Islamic ethics, this command to enjoin right and forbid wrong. Is this really how we the basic premise that we use to think about Islamic ethics. But actually, this very premise 
spawned into a variety of Islamic forms of literature, philosophical, legal, and also, the thing we don't think about, adab literature, which is um, literary literature, if I can put it like that, which is really about how people who were writers and poets and lyricists, how they thought of literature, uh, sorry, how they thought of ethics, why they said chivalry was an ethical thing, why they said hospitality was an ethical commandment. And then I realized but how most Muslims think of ethics is what does the Sharia say? Because Sharia for them is ethics. And of course, as most of us know, Sharia is hugely complex. It is simply not about this is what the Quran says, this is what the Hadith says. If it hadn't been so complex, Sharia would never have spawned into the classical jurisprudence, the biggest, most intellectually challenging way of doing Islamic thought. Not philosophy, not theology, but Islamic law. Because all of Islamic law is really about how does one worship God and lead the life that God wants you to. And that, in to um, echo what Naveed is saying, is an open-ended discussion and has to be an open-ended discussion. I, for one, would never say that the corpus of Islamic law writings came to some kind of definitive end at any point in time. These classical scholars talked to each other in a way that was open-ended. They ended with saying things like, and God knows best, because there was a sense of humility. We don't know the answer, but we think that this could be an answer. And yet Sharia has now been reduced, and I use that word carefully, to this is right and this is wrong. And for me, I think that is one of the biggest problems within Islamic and Muslim societies. The desire to know unequivocally what is right and what is wrong and not make space for those complex gray areas where most of us live our lives, where most of us, if we are honest with ourselves, struggle with our lives. There are, of course, um, some classical ethicists, such as Tusi, Mishkawe and Razi. And of course, the ethical norms uh, tied in with philosophy came to us in the 8th, 9th century through the rise of the philosophical school, the Mutazalites. And for them, the main thing was that revelation on its own could not just tell you, so by revelation I mean the Quran, and for some people would mean prophetic words and hadith as well. Revelation on its own could not tell you ethically what was right and wrong you had to apply your own human reason. Revelation was there, but in order for us to think, just because God says something doesn't mean that it's necessarily rationally right or wrong. We have the natural ability, and I'm quoting for one of them, to know the right independently of any command or revelation as is shown by the existence of some true moral judgments outside of Sharia. So this moral imperative to think about morality is what is at the forefront of being a person of faith. We can't hide from that. We can't leave it to, oh, this is something that somebody else has to define. And when I say ethics, that includes everything, not just the way you live your life and worship, but issues around human rights, gender justice, um, abuse, violence, and not just on a local scale, but also on a global scale. In 2016, uh, Modern Challenges to Islamic Law Book, um, the, Shaheen Zardar Ali, who some of you may know, she's a professor at um, the law school at University of Warwick, said that she was standing, she found herself in this book, standing at the Dehlis of Islamic law. Dehlis is a, a word common to Arabic, Persian, and Urdu languages, and it actually means a threshold. When you stand at the Dehlis of anything, you're standing at the threshold. You're not out and you're not quite in. She uses the word as a metaphor to explain her approach to Islamic law and to say that we cannot think of Islamic law just within our professional journey. We have to personalize it. We cannot have this abstract system of law which says and theorizes but has no bearing on the way we live our lives. She, she argues Sharia is a catch-all word here we find diversity, authority, humility, parad paradox, and contradiction in humor. But for me, Islamic law is a clumsy translation we have used. 
we translate Sharia as Islamic law. However we understand it, it is through the community's understanding of law, or to be more precise, God's law, whereby human beings manifest themselves in a, non, in a Muslim environment. If we are to think about how is Islamic law um, relevant to us at all times, then we have to think of, do we need to actually go back and think about right and wrong in a very different way? Not just theoretical commands, but actually in the lived realities of our lives. Because we cannot but be influenced by changing norms of human rights, by changing norms of pluralism, by changing norms of all of us, what, or most of us, what does it mean to be living as a minority in a non-Muslim country? And I would strongly echo this idea that you cannot be defined by anger, you cannot be defined by minor minority status, you cannot be defined by thinking constantly, I'm a Muslim and there's Islamophobia everywhere. You cannot be defined by anger. And, and that sentiment of things are being done to us that we have no control. Because the only person who has control is you yourself in your own individual way. So for me, ethics is that moral discursiveness. And I'm really pleased that New Horizons has made a space that allows for a variety of voices. Whether we agree or disagree, that's not the issue. And just before I come to the Sharia review, just to say that agreement is not a moral entity. Agreement is not a moral exercise. It's how you agree and disagree well to make spaces for all kinds of visions of life. The idea that we have to be unified, where did this come from? It's the beauty of any discussion is how diversity is reflected in that. And I'm just realizing that the microphone is working now. <laughs> Let me just say something quickly about the Sharia review because uh, Rabia did um, suggest that I um, talk about that. So um, this has taken over a year and a bit now to, um, to come into fruition. It was published about three or four weeks ago. It was a home office initiative to have an independent review about um, what is happening in Sharia councils, specifically in England and Wales. And again, the reason I took this on was actually it's an ethical exercise for me. It wasn't because, oh, the Home Office has asked me, of course it's interesting to do work that might affect state policy. But it was more about, I didn't know, I'd never been to a Sharia Council. I didn't know who used them. I didn't know why they were used. Just very briefly, the things that stood out for me is a number of women who use Sharia councils for the same reason. Not women that you might classify in the older generation, not women in their 60s and 70s or 80s, young women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, who are using Sharia councils because they never thought of registering their marriage under civil law. Then when they come to divorce, they have no recourse to any civil protection. That was the first challenge. Secondly, actually visiting these Sharia councils and realizing what they did made me realize huge variety of practice. They're not courts. The people who run them are not judges. They have no legal entity. They have no legal um, authority under civil law. They are voluntary associations set up for people who need them. If you didn't need them, they wouldn't exist. And the reason I'm saying this is because it may sound very obvious to some of you, but in the wider press, there are these kind of really weird courts. Uh, they run a parallel legal system. You cannot have a parallel legal system when your legal system isn't recognized. And thirdly, um, I think that the striking thing for me was how much um, abuse, and I use the word not in the way we use abuse loosely now, how much abuse there is of people's rights within Muslim societies. And by that I mean not necessarily that people are told you can't say this or you can't say that, but the more subtle ways of keeping control, the more subtle ways of making people conform to tradition, and sometimes the very overt ways of making people think you cannot think for yourself. This is the way it's been, and this is the way it's always going to be. I'm just going to conclude in the next two or three minutes. So for me, the most interesting thing was, there's only so much we can do. But the most important thing you need to do 
is to raise awareness within Muslim societies that if they are to live as full citizens within this country, they have to abide by the civil law of this country. It's not an option. It's not about the civil law being something that's imposed on you. That is the only law that's going to give you the protection. That doesn't deny your right to have an Islamic, legal, Islamic religious marriage. Of course it doesn't. But in order for you to be fully protected under the state, you have to register your marriage. Is that going to happen? That's one of our recommendations. The recommendation that is not going to go ahead is regulation of Sharia councils. And that's partly, partly because the government is too scared to regulate a religious body or bodies, but also because some concern is if you start regulating something, you're giving it credence. You're giving it an authority that it doesn't have. But the challenge for us is these councils aren't going anywhere. Women will still need them for Islamic divorces. How do we make them better? Where is the ethical imperative to make sure that bodies of people who decide on male and female futures are acting ethically? They're not just picking out certain verses and saying, you have to do this, but thinking within the broader context of what does it mean to live as a Muslim in 21st century UK. If you don't think of it like that, you're going to go nowhere. Because those words matter, 21st century UK. And the second uh, recommendation, which the government says it's going to take on, is actually about cultural awareness. Making people know of their rights is actually an ethical duty. It isn't that if you don't tell somebody of their right, you might be able to get away with something. It's if people know their rights, not in a militant way, not in a defensive way, but just as God has given me these rights. It's not easy to escape family thresholds. It's not easy to fight for your rights. We know that. It's not easy to even self-determine. We, we know that. And as Muslim women, we know that. But without voices that speak up for what is morally just, things will not change. And we need the whole of society on board for that. This isn't a male-female issue. So just to conclude, for me, ethics is the, the discipline par excellence for Muslims and for Islamic society. And I think that although we subsume it under law, to speak of it only as Sharia is to reduce it. We have to think of it as beyond Sharia. Thank you. Thank you.